Hano, would you like to get us started? Sure. I'm certainly glad that you volunteered to do this event. I'm, I'm curious, uh, could you share a little bit about your background and, and maybe what led you to uh, share today how to, how to help organizations get through the crisis? Of course, thanks. Uh, good evening from me. Uh, it's uh, five o'clock where I am. Uh, my background is an office. Um, I'm in um, consulting and advisory. I've been doing this for about 12 years or so. Usually help companies with uh, strategy or product development. This means they need to do things differently that they haven't done uh, before. I've used uh, Kinevin and um, Wardly Maps and Wardly Mapping um, in the past couple of years extensively. So if there's an organization that wants to do better it, in times of crisis, these are the two most useful tools I can think of that can give people new perspectives and a way of uh, improving their current state. So today, Hanno is going to share with us two main sections on both Kinevin and Wardley Mapping. Um, and then we'll stick around a little bit afterwards for an after hours discussion where you can pick Hanno's brain and we can talk a little bit more about uh, what, what he shares today. So we'll, we'll get started with complexity in times of crisis and then we'll talk about strategic situational awareness. Mm -hmm. um, how many of you um, are familiar with the um, Nevin, the work of uh, Dave Snowden? Show of hands or maybe uh, something in chat. Question number two. How many of you have been able to use it for something practical, something that is a tangible problem that has been solved with the help of Kim Nevin? Yes. Usually when I ask this in front of groups of people, not many hands go up for the second part. But in times of crisis, um, Kim Nevin is very useful. What's a crisis? Uh, crisis is a time of intense difficulty or danger. When I looked it up on uh, Google, which means it's true, it probably also means that it stands for decision in uh, Greek. Kinevin is a decision-making framework. It helps you uh, make better decisions and act accordingly. Uh, Kinevin describes the world and systems in the world, des describes them in three different uh, categories or groups or the correct word is domains. Three types of systems, uh, ordered systems. These are your complicated and obvious systems. The cause and effect um, relationship is known and can be predicted in advance. There are complex systems where cause and effect is only clear after the fact and in necessary time, in needed time, you cannot analyze it. And then there's chaotic systems, systems where there is no cause and effect relationship. Obvious systems are your traffic lights, for example. Everyone understands red, amber and green. Everyone accepts it and acts accordingly. Complicated systems. My car is a complicated system. I cannot fix my car but there are mechanics who can analyze it and they can fix it. Complex systems are things such as rainforests, human organizations, human societies. Sometimes the same thing happens twice, usually it doesn't. If it does, it happens that way by accident. And chaotic systems, think of yourself waking up in a house that's on fire. Then what you need to do immediately there is to simply run out of the building because there are no necessary conditions that keep things together. In crisis, we're talking 9-11, or maybe in this case, the first couple of days of a corona pandemic. So therefore, in all of these different domains, you need to act differently. In chaotic systems, it doesn't make sense to analyze. You don't wake up in a burning building and start analyzing, how long is it gonna take until the roof falls on top of me? What should I really do? It's all about establishing order as quickly as possible. 
This means top-down control. Uh, this means immediate action in order to stabilize the situation. After 9-11, Rudy Giuliani was an excellent mayor due to his communication style and the, the way of action. After the crisis receded and he offered to stay for another time period, people didn't really want to have that. Once uh, you have stabilized the system, your domain moves into complex domain. So here you cannot analyze everything in advance, but you do small probes, small experiments, and then respond accordingly. In your usual everyday life, it's more of a complicated system. This is the domain of experts. An expert knows how to come up with a better Excel sheet. It knows how to fix your car, how to tune it. These are bureaucrats. These are people who are subject matter experts in complicated situations. None of these are any better than the other. They're simply different. And this uh, dictates that you need to act differently. Why today? Why is this important? The management style of leading your organization through this type of change, uh, ne it necessitates, it needs that everyone understands that we cannot come up with long-term plans and the way to act in complex environments through probing, sensing and responding is to come up with a necessary model of how do things actually look so that we could probe. And the best tool for doing that is a different framework that's known as Wardley mapping. Wardley mapping is not a decision-making framework. It's a communication framework. But in order to be more effective um, in a complex domain, Wardley provides you with a bunch of great, great tools. Complex domain is the domain of unknown unknowns. We don't know what we don't know. In complicated domains, there are known unknowns that you can sort of take into account and play with. I spent my childhood in the loving arms of the Soviet Union and the Soviet Union in its economy, it had four basic problems and they always came as a surprise. So you could, those were known unknowns. And those, uh, if you don't know, were fall, summer, winter and spring. There was a fifth unknown, which was international imperialism, but that was sort of, you could take into account. In chaotic domains, there are unknowable unknowns, things that you cannot predict at all in advance. Therefore, if you've done, or if an organization has acted in one way uh, throughout the times, which is historically how it's been doing business, it's hard to tell them that this is not the correct way to answer or act anymore. However, if the crisis becomes overwhelming, then some people might uh, accept a different uh, way of acting. And now is your chance. There's also a fifth domain that goes unnamed, which is in the center of this picture. It is the domain, what's it called? Anyone? It's known as this order. This order is the domain where most organizations uh, find themselves at all times because they don't know in which domain they are and they prefer to act as they've historically acted or how they prefer to act. Um, a few questions. Think about the, the organization that you're thinking of leading today. Mm, this could be your employer, this could be your client. You could also think of this as the nation state where you are. You could think of this organization as any coherent system, as your uh, local borough or local surroundings, local group of people, whichever you choose. I'm choosing an organization that provides value to customers. Question number one, in which domain is your organization currently? I'm asking what you think, and I'm also asking what do others around you, what do your colleagues think? What's it more like? Complex, complicated, disorder, or chaotic? In all domains at the same time. Complex, complex, 
disorder. Hmm. I see Mark replying that um, he's agreeing with Dimitar that it depends on which aspect of the organization we're talking about. I completely agree with that. Both Wardy Maps, Wardy Mapping and uh, Kinevin are supposed to help you make context specific and appropriate decisions depending on uh, where you are or what we're talking about. So it's not a one size fits all tool, chaotic and complex. Multiple domains depending on the problem being faced. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask you, what are the consequences of misdiagnosis? So if people think we are in one domain and uh, turns out it's not what they think it is, what might be some examples of consequences of misdiagnosis? Feel welcome to unmute yourself or type something in chat. I'll comment on what I'm seeing in the chat room here. People analyze instead of acting. There can be inappropriate mental models and action. Uh, feel free to add specific instances. What I'm seeing, for example, in this um, current crisis is people's response to uh, how urgent they think the problem is. Uh, if there's urgency involved or not involved. Someone, oh, Dimitar says, communism is like thinking we're uncomplicated all the time. Communism. Um, in, during times of war, uh, autocracy uh, makes a lot of sense. Uh, during times of chaos, uh, autocratic leadership is completely appropriate. Fascists love that because they get uh, total control over everyone and get to tell them what to do and how to do it. They'd love to have more control throughout the rest of their lives and portray themselves as the only saviors in any given situation. Other, comment, uh, other comments, COVID-19 paralysis instead of action. Arguments about the one right way to act. Yes, it's, uh, for example, if you could give an example for the one right way to act, I'd appreciate that as well. Incorrect prognosis and treatments, answering the wrong questions, making wrong decisions. Oh, hunger is a good example of something right now. Hunger is always a good example of great palinka. Taking on a project, thinking it's just complicated when in fact it's complex. The point I'm trying to get across is that there is context specific correct way to act. Um, Kinevin doesn't tell you uh, what to do or how to do it. It simply says what types of efforts are futile or misplaced in any given context. And this context shift is probably beginning to dawn on a lot of people. Mm. Whenever this ends, the world will look different. There are probably many, many things on uh, people's different uh, radars that are going to look different, but many of us agree that it's probably not going to be exactly the same. Now, what to do about it? This all sounds fancy and nice. No one disagrees. Yeah, woohoo, let's go, let's go ahead, let's do that. How to actually get out of it is in um, taking uh, systems from chaotic to complex and from complex to complicated, you usually play with the uh, constraints and boundaries. Think of it like a door. A door can be um, in three stages or three ways. It can be closed, it can be open, or it can have a bouncer at the door who decides who gets in, who doesn't get in. So usually you map out what are the different types of constraints. Uh, where are things uh, closed today? Where are they open? What should we change? You're trying, if there's anything I can guarantee you in complex environments is that the bigger your intervention, the bigger the unintended consequences. So small uh, probing experiments 
um, are great for making progress in complex environments. In Estonia, where I'm from, we had a previous government who raised the excise tax for alcohol by 30%. Seems like a great intention. Uh, the unintended consequences of that were uh, less funds to the government because people started buying alcohol abroad. Certain people started hoarding alcohol and now had a ready supply of alcohol, which meant that alcoholism didn't subside, but it only increased in certain areas. Unintended consequences as such. So in order to make better decisions, you need to have better situational awareness. I know of no better tools. There are others and there may be other and better ways, but I don't use them personally day to day. And for that, Wardler mapping is fantastic. It's about creating situational awareness so that you can understand what's going on. That means perception. And once you perceive something's going on, you can comprehend what could that mean. And after that, you could project. For example, currently, if I look up, sometimes I see birds. So I perceive birds are flying for some reason. This might lead me to uh, start thinking, why is that happening? What just happened? The seasons changed, for example. These might be migratory birds. And the projection might be that once the seasons change again, the bird behavior might change again. And Wardley maps provide an invaluable discussion tool so that everyone across the organization can have meaningful discussions, then make decisions and act on it. If we look at the really simple Wardley map, it's, it looks um, like your standard two by two chart. There's a vertical axis and there's a horizontal axis. What you need to know is that the vertical axis is simply how close to the customer or the beneficiary is the thing that is needed. It all begins with a customer. The customer has needs. Peter Drucker said that the point of an organization is to have a customer. So every organization has a beneficiary or a customer. And so that we could serve those needs, we're gonna have a couple of things. In this example, this is a tea shop. It has two types of customers, business uh, customers and people that walk in off the street. Their need is they want to have a cup of tea. Everything else on this map is needed in order to deliver this cup of tea to these two types of customers so that we can now discuss whether to have these assets or not to have these assets. We can list capital, data, practices, whatever you want, but this is the simplest way of looking at it. Looking at the horizontal axis is evolution, evolution of ideas. Someone comes up with a new idea in a lab. Uh, a couple of scientists do it. It doesn't really work at first in only specific instances. Then we know more about this product and we can custom, custom build it. For example, someone wants a new fancy suit, we can make a custom suit out of it. After we know how to build custom suits, we can industrialize that. So we can have off the shelf suits instead of simply custom built suits. And sooner or later, these turn into commodities. So these are really well understood, well known commodities where price is um, of high importance. Think of electricity, for example. So the way to map out your situational awareness of what's actually needed for this organization to exist is a value chain. This is the list of a value chain. At the top, is something that the customer sees and experiences firsthand at the bottom. Something is needed and necessary, but the customer really doesn't know what's going on there. Where the power comes from uh, in this little tea shop or tea restaurant, they really don't care, neither do they feel it, but it needs to be there. As our next exercise, I'm going to ask you to split into groups and uh, come up with a uh, an initial Wardley map. We're gonna switch over to mural and in all groups, I would appreciate it if you had uh, people with at least two roles. Someone who's l slightly familiar with Wardley mapping, number one, and number two, someone who's willing to um, volunteer a case study 
or an organization or a situation. So you have something tangible. So it's not everything conceptual and up in the air. Pick a, a challenge that you have and map out um, your current state. So in all groups, someone who's done worldly mapping at least a little bit before, and number two, someone who's willing to volunteer a case study. We should maybe also show what uh, they need to achieve or should we split into groups first? So what I'll do is in Zoom, I'm going to form some breakout groups. And uh, what I have is I'll have three groups. And in group one, we have Douglas, Jan, Katrin, Mark McCoy, Mark Pearson, Martin, Matt, Niles, and Tina. In that list of people that I just mentioned, is there someone there who's made a worldly map before? Just raise your head in, or raise your hand in the camera. Okay, great. So we've got plenty of people who've done worldly mapping before. Um, does someone in this group have a case study that they'd be willing to, to volunteer? It could just be an organization that you're a part of, uh, something oriented to this question of an organizational crisis. Uh, mention something in chat or just uh, raise your hand again if you wouldn't mind volunteering a scenario to be mapped by the group. The thing is, I do not know what we are looking for. What we cool. are looking for. Yeah, so what we're hoping to do is have a discussion about risk, about opportunity, and also about actions that can be taken as a result of thinking about that situation. So for example, one of the things that's on my mind right now is, is my, my organization, right, is my family. <laughs> and so in the COVID-19 scenario, I'm constantly thinking about what assets we have, what capabilities we have as a group, and how uh, we as a family need to navigate the crisis as things get worse in the United States. And so I, I'm thinking about things like uh, having our vehicle right prepared and ready to go in order to get groceries or to, to leave if we need to, those kinds of things. Now an organization is gonna have a different set of concerns, but by describing the organization in terms of a value chain and in terms of a worldly map, it just creates a setting for us to have a discussion about risk and about opportunities in this crisis context. So we don't need to target it too closely, but if someone doesn't mind just volunteering the context that they're a part of as, as a wave, a, a thing for us to examine together, I think there are no super specific goals uh, in terms of uh, what, what special kind of uh, qualities an organization has to have. It's, it's just who would be willing to be the situation expert and, and be the, the person who knows the answers about the situation as the group maps the thing together. Does that make sense, Jan? Um, yeah, it does make sense. I'm just thinking uh, if it's suitable, for example, uh, to map uh, that uh, my own organization, I, I run a small design agency, uh, I have just lost an important client. Mm. That's a perfect scenario. Yeah. Rises. yeah. Yeah. Another option is to say, I'm asking for a friend. A friend has a, a design uh, studio. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know that friend really well. <laughs> Excellent. And so, yeah. Okay, so that's group one, more or less sorted out. Group two, I have Dominic, Aitan, Kathy, Lucy, Martin, Mike Haber, Stuart, PJ, and Vinayak. Uh, has someone in that group done worldly mapping before? If you wouldn't mind just saying so in chat. Okay, great. Thank you, Mike. And uh, amongst yourselves, go through the same thing we just did, where you, you uh, pick someone in the group who would be willing to be a situation expert or be a situation expert on behalf of their friend to provide a context for us to talk about risk. <laughs> and then group three is Darren, Dimitar, Erland, Leon, Andre, Ro, Steven, Tavi, and Tom. Is someone in that group, has someone in that group done worthy mapping before? Just let me know. Excellent. Okay, perfect. So everyone has a group with uh, folks who have done worthy mapping before. I'm going to open the rooms 
have a discussion about whose situation to map out. And uh, we'll come back in a couple minutes. Um, you'll be working in Mural. And so I'll post a link to the Mural board in chat again, um, but I'll open the, the boards here um, as well. Hang tight. All right. The link is in chat. I'm op opening the rooms. If you need any help at any point, I'll be coming around to each of the groups just to check in. We can go ahead and get started. Thanks for, thank you for doing this with us. This is really um, exciting. Uh, and I appreciate you all taking the time to work with, Jan, are you okay? <laughs> I love the faces you make, man. Um, yeah, so I, I know that that was not enough time to make a map, right? And yet you all got through the value chain part of it and built an understanding together of the system that you didn't have before, which means that you could start having good discussions about uh, risks and opportunities. And so I was wondering if someone in the room feels particularly brave, uh, that they would like to share what they did in their map uh, which, which group that you were in, let us know, and then I'll, I'll pull up the, the map so everyone can see. Um, but who, who would feel brave enough to share what they discovered with their group? Anyone? I know someone here has just been an extrovert dying, sitting at home. Yeah, this is Dimitar. I can share what we did. Uh, Excellent. Like, you were group very, three, right? Like, quickly, right? Uh, so this is group three. And it uh, and we and what we did, we try to map the same case when we have a lost client, right? Um, or a, a friend of us has uh, just lost a client. And what we did, we 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 started with the anchor, which is our customer uh, at the at the top, and then we we uh, uh, put a sticky for the design service that we provide the customer with. And then we put the, the resources, the next part of the value chain, the design team, and then the resources that and things and practices and knowledge that the design team needs in order to provide the service, which is the knowledge, software, computers, uh, workspace. At the bottom, we have electricity, right? So that's, that's the part of the value chain for providing the, this design service. And then we started with the sales team which also serves the customer. Uh, first of all, finding the customer and then uh, the second step while we're providing the service, the, the sales team has to actually kind of uh, assure that uh, the customer will be successful with us. And we didn't have that much time actually to finish this, but the idea is that the sales team will have to uh, again, uh, need some tooling and some knowledge and stuff. And we focus especially on the co uh, the remote collaboration part, which uh, it is missing on the map. But the idea was that in this time of crisis, uh, the, the, the sales team will need to change their practice from face-to-face -face meeting the customer into something like remote uh, probably, and, and that's where we finished, right? And what is Excellent. missing, at least from my point of view, is this risk part. So how to map the losing the customer, I have never done this, right? I mean, so this is uh, this is maybe something we could uh, address. So if, if somebody else uh, Yeah, share, Anno, yeah. what do you have to say about that? Because this looks like an excellent value chain, but I'm curious if you can help talk a little bit about the risks part of this. Sure, could you zoom in on that, please? So the point of... Uh, um, a first glance is to understand the, what world I'm living in. Where are the monsters, big monsters, where are the small monsters? So in times of crisis, the cost of delay is rapidly changing and a lot of unknown unknowns. So you want to understand where am I most exposed uh, to issues here? Where can something hit me hard? What I would uh, drill into would be, it says design service. What is the actual need there? And uh, what are the types of customers uh, we are using uh, to give it to. So the value proposition of that design service can be different. And you can probably identify new segments of clients. And you would use a volume map to make this big picture. And then at the, if I zoom into one little sticky, 
I may use a business model canvas or a startup canvas to drill deeper. So the issue there, if you can use, uh, this was the situation three months ago and this is the current thing, why is something not working here anymore? What could be done? So I'd look for new uh, clients and uh, how to retain old clients. There's probably something with the messaging that needs to change now, a new type of value so that you're relevant today as you were previously. Something happened, hence we need to change as well. So yeah, let's, let's continue that conversation in a second. But uh, Hanno, I want to give you the chance to sort of wrap us up and, and talk us through the last few parts of your slides. Um, so we, we, let me know where, where you want me to head with this. Right. Uh, a couple of points to make. Uh, wordly mapping is a tool. Um, a fool with a tool is uh, still a fool. Uh, just because you can map everything doesn't mean that you should map uh, everything. Wordly mapping as a communication, communication framework has its uses. I'll give you some examples that I've done. I've uh, helped uh, the CIO of the Estonian Post map out his organization. It's a small 100 million uh, euro operation when compared to other postal uh, places elsewhere in the world. But when the CIO left to join another company, he told me after a week that he couldn't uh, dream of doing his new operations, chief operations officer job without a map. It would be unbelievably harder than that. Um, used it for software companies to come up with RFPs for situations in Africa, mm, um, other mm, telling school of music, these types of organizations. So the challenge needs to be big enough, at least, or complexity. In times of crisis, if things are complex, you need to probe, sense, and respond. But where do you probe? And uh, what is possible for that you need situational awareness and coming up with uh, a common understanding what the situation is their worldly mapping can be invaluable as such so That's if you understand its point. limits if you understand the limits of this tool and uh, what you're trying to achieve with it this is not a, a new type of silver bullet or a religion that can be everywhere but i hope you've uh, found ways how to get something out of it you've now done this with 20 other people in 20 minutes, people you've probably never met before. Imagine what you could do in your own organization with people you have met and with some good guidance and how to do these things. Good recommendation is to go to uh, learnwordlymapping.com, Ben, right? Oh, thanks. <laughs> I appreciate the plug. One of my clients says it's his favorite way to learn wordly mapping. Uh, you can Amazing. get started there. And I know you can also offer some things as well, right? What? And you also offer some help with this sort of thing as well, right? Sure. I've helped uh, others um, to get started with the worldly mapping. Um, send me something or ask me a question and I'll respond. If you have questions how to uh, look at your map or what else you could do in your situations. If you want another look at it, feel free to uh, contact me. Well, I just wanted to thank you so much for putting all this material together and, and sharing it with us. I, I've really been needing more uh, like ways to think about using Kinevin. I, I love the fact that you point out how uh, wordly mapping can help you understand where to do uh, probe sense respond, where to, where to think of the, like basically where to know where the complexity is in your organization. Um, that's something that I, I hadn't fully considered before. And so I really appreciate that, that point. Um, I'd, I'd like to sort of start an after hours discussion in a moment. I was wondering if you had anything else you'd like to share um, about uh, your work or your thoughts on this. Let me just uh, tie a bow together what we did today and then we'll close and stay for after hours, whoever is interested. Um, guiding your organization through the crisis. Uh, there, Kinevin helps you understand what has changed in your environment and that you should act uh, differently. It helps you build awareness. Uh, that something needs to be done. But how to actually do it, worldly mapping is an excellent tool for that. I wanted you to go through a value chain and identify your high, highest sources of risk and highest sources of opportunity because something has rapidly changed and radically uh, been altered. So if you have a good understanding, for example, in the future world, geography is going to start to matter again. So where am I exposed to things uh, that I didn't know I was exposed to previously? and then also understanding what needs are we serving that we shouldn't be serving, vice versa, to make better strategic decisions. 
So I hope to, to lead you down two rabbit holes. It's worldly mapping and Kinevin. Both of those check out. Take my word for it. Um, best of uh, luck and uh, see you on the other side. <laughs> Thank you, Hannah, so much for sharing your time with us. Um, and yeah, thanks everyone for being here. Um, I know uh, Dimitar and, and Hanno, I, I was kind of curious to maybe explore this question a little bit further about finding the opportunities and risks within the value chain. Maybe we could uh, start by exploring that a little bit for the after hours session. Um, you mentioned, so when we were looking at this value chain about the design service, you mentioned actually zooming in on that component and maybe doing a business model canvas to understand that, that section of the value chain more uh, closely and, and clearly. How else might you explore risks specifically in a value chain? I would ask them what happened. They lost a customer, something is going wrong. Something is not up to specification. So something must have happened there. Where is he saying where the problem is? I would drill in further. Is yeah, and a problem can come from a lot of different places, right? Like they're um, in complexity. It can be a dispositional thing that causes the end result, right? So it could be an interesting interaction and, and sort of back and forth between uh, the customer losing funding or the, the services provider not meeting a, a, the, the standard for quality. Um, and then like 10 other things that might be completely unrelated. How do you start to pin down how all those different things contribute using worldly mapping to sort of understand the space, but then navigating it effectively with Kinevin? Let me paraphrase my answer to it. I don't see a lot of, after you know that uh, things are in a hurry and we cannot analyze our way out of this, we need to start acting and what the places are. I don't get any much more use from Kinevin. What are we going to do? Social network stimulation, these types of issues that he's proposing with SenseMaker. All of these things make sense in their own context as well. I have not been successful with it. My customers aren't really interested in dispositional states or three different types of value. They don't have time for that. Mm. Maybe it's just me. Um, they'd like to have the business results in their office slightly quicker than that. And they hate me for what they call academic discussion. <laughs> I, I think probably more than one of us have, have experienced that uh, time and time before. Mark's nodding his head. Mike's it's, I want to be in their world uh, wearing their boots, using their lingo and their terms. Um, if there's something I can pull out of, uh, let's say, I'm not even going to start with dark constraints or something like that, but, or dispositional probabilities, unless sounds like too out of this world uh, for my daily use. Um, in this design service, I'd uh, like to ask what's worked for you so far, what you're not uh, seeing here. How are you, uh, let's, it's uh, something better than scenario planning. This would enable you to at least have your um, red, amber and green scenarios and what to do, what types of uh, customers are likely to disappear from us as soon as possible. What types of services could we launch as fast as possible. What are other ways of doing it? This is only supposed to be a communication framework. Now there are a lot of great economic patterns, for example, to look at, but most of those, or most of the value in worldly mapping comes from operational issues, not so much strategic issues. So not changes in uh, segments that you serve or the value that you provide, but how you do it so that you can reduce duplication, for example, improve communication, these types of issues. So it's still you looking at this map. Some people are better at looking at maps, at least now that everyone has the same map, they're able to converse at the same level. Discuss, decide and act. I don't see much more from Kinevin that I need to use. I'm curious if anyone here has, has used Kinevin in other ways or might have uh, some commentary on that. Or if, if you just want to have a different question, you want to take the conversation a different way. I know I, I want to spend some more time understanding Kinevin and, and kind of the, the use cases for things like SenseMaker and dispositional interaction, but it is really hard to justify all the, all the things that have to be done just right for all that to work. And I'm, I'm, I'm maybe hopeful that in the future that becomes easier to use and deploy, but I'm curious if other people have thoughts. 
I've ended up using um, using the standard Stefan like map and putting my putting aspects of a of a problem or project onto it and deciding how to approach those problems. Uh, that was I found quite successful. Um, it just helped crystallize more of our thoughts on how to actually approach the problems we were looking at. I've used validated learning type of techniques with it as well and identifying what do we need to validate. And again, that sort of determines how you approach those validations. But yeah, I've not, <laughs> I've not dreamt of even using something like SenseMaker. I don't even know where I'd start. I, I like the idea of, of SenseMaker a lot. Um, I, I think it has a lot of ways to go in terms of the design part of it and the deployment part of it. Um, but I, I, think the, I think the overall idea is sound. It's just that it requires a willingness to take the time to collect narratives. Like, I don't know how many people have, have, have looked at SenseMaker before, but roughly the idea is you, you prompt people with uh, basically an opportunity to tell some micro narratives, small stories, uh, and you give them a prompt and it might be something about management decision making. You know, tell me a story about management decision making that's happened in the last couple of weeks. And so they'll tell the story. And then what SenseMaker and, and generally speaking, this idea of, of uh, self signification is, is that instead of an expert looking at the story and telling the, the, you know, the world what that story means, the person who tells the story gets to say what it means. And so it converts qualitative information into quantitative information. So like uh, maybe if it's a story about management, you say, you might say, did people use analytical decision-making in this management decision or did they use uh, intuitive decision-making? And so that simple like dipole back and forth, the person who told the story can place a node on that, that gradient and say, well, this felt more analytical uh, or this felt more uh, intuitive. Oh, I know, I know Dave Snowden likes his triads, but he also does dyads as well. Um, and, and then uh, before we get into it, like uh, there's Cynthia Kurtz has a whole body of work on participatory narrative inquiry, uh, which really doesn't like triads. <laughs> so there's a, whole, there's a whole thing there. But you convert the qualitative information into quantitative information, and that gives you a disposition of kind of roughly what kinds of decisions are being made in the company. And so you have like groups of people that are making very analytical decisions and groups of people that are making very intuitive decisions. And so then the question becomes, once you have knowledge of that disposition, you can run safe to fail experiments if you think directionally we should have more or less of something. And then you can watch as the stories change over time. And I think that's the power of SenseMaker, but it's just an awful lot of moving parts to make work. And so that, that I think is the challenge for many organizations is justifying all those moving parts and, and uh, be them willing to be open-minded enough. Like you think it's hard to get people to make worthy maps. Imagine how hard it is to get people to do dispositional safe to fail experiments uh, that, that use a, a complicated tool like SenseMaker. It's, it's I'm sure a problem many that work with Dave have. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm talking a lot. So I'm curious what other people are thinking about right now and, and wondering about. I've used SenseMaker, I've, no, I've used Dave's Kinevin ideas to try and challenge where people have preconceived ideas about the best way to approach something. And um, I've tried to use like fairly simple metaphors, you know, like spread betting. You know, a spread betting is like almost safe to fail experiments. <laughs> you know, if you're not really sure, you know, maybe put a bet on two or three horses, but don't put all your money on because that would be bad. And by by using kind of metaphors like that, you can kind of almost you know get around the academia. And I th I think, as I understand it, the whole. The next level of sense maker is when you've mapped what kind of decisions people are making and what they're doing is you're looking for what Dave calls the 18% who see the things, it's the weak signal detection, who see things coming that no one else sees. And I guess if you found, if you found it hard getting people to use sense maker, you're probably going to find it even harder to get people to take a decision that only 18% of people see. <laughs> yeah, one of the things I remember hearing from, from 
some of Dave's work is like focusing on the exceptions or, or the weird outliers yeah. uh, as, as a thing to go investigate and learn about rather than something that you should drive out of the system. I'm curious if you know more about that, Mike. No, I've recently become a premium member, so I'm just about to trawl through everything. And I've done the foundations course last year. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So that's me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious if anybody else has done any of the, the Kinevin related courses. I really want to do a master class at some point. Hano's not nodding his head. Yeah, I, I, I did it, the master class in 2016 uh, in oh, nice. uh, Amsterdam. Was it? Yes. And my, it's, it's, uh, my advice, if you go there, I would go prepared. Uh, which means I would read all his articles, not the blog post, the blog post also will help, but he has published some articles through the years, like uh, 2003, 2005, 6, 11. And because if you, if at least what I, what I heard from the participants that uh, my, my understanding is that if you are not prepared, you will not be able to take the full value of it, right? Because, uh, it's not uh, people are asking questions the the things go to the left and to the right and one has to know actually what why is there and then uh, ask a specific questions on 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 uh, which cannot be found in the articles or in the blog posts right because most of the stuff is not to be found in the blog posts. Uh, that that would be my advice but i would uh, highly recommend attending a a, a class because because just reading the blog posts, at least for me, uh, like through the years before the master class, it was not the real thing. It's uh, the knowledge is not in the blog post. I mean, the the whole package of knowledge is not in the blog. You have to, at least for me, uh, p people learn different ways. Yeah. Yeah, I've That's seen that opinion. there's there's a lot of information that doesn't get shared in public um, that Dave shares in, in the master classes. Um, so that's, that's definitely uh, something to consider. If you Google strategic understanding with Pro Professor Dave Snowden, he's doing something that he did a couple of years ago in uh, South Africa, five years ago. There's a day long thing that he does with a local government or local utility, uh, is my guess. There he does a long, uh, but excellent explanation. Mm -hmm. The methodology of Kinevin cannot easily be separated from its author, or it's so much better if, if uh, Sting uh, sings a message in a bottle than anyone else uh, doing it. So uh, <laughs> you get to experience him in full bloom telling his uh, great stories there. Uh, yeah, I see some, some YouTube videos, Strategic Understanding with Professor Dave Stone. Yeah, it's that a five-part series from the exactly. Da Vinci Institute, and I'll, I'll post the link to the first of that. Yeah, you're yeah. gonna need five hours to <laughs> watch through it. That makes sense. There uh, it is. If, what I've been able to use from his thing that has sort of stuck with me is an, if you're a Prima member, no, no, now it's no longer needed. It's described elsewhere as well. Is an exercise of ritual descent that I found useful from uh, Kinevin that I can use in multiple contexts uh, if needed. I like uh, the future backwards as well. There's a lot of interesting stuff there. Yeah, I wonder if the um, you know, the future backwards and looking how things might turn out could be used on parts of the Wardley mapping when you're looking at futures and where things might move on the map. Yeah, I, I think so for sure, especially when we talk about weak signal detection. Uh, one of the things that we, uh, Jabe and I talked about in the, in the anticipatory awareness workshop last week, is you almost have to tell stories about, it's, it's specifically stories about possibilities um, that you tell in a way that makes them uh, plausible. And yeah. I, I don't know how many people were here uh, also were in, in the anticipatory awareness things, but we talked about like, how would you know if someone sent you a glitter bomb? And so, a glitter bomb is a, is a ridiculous device. It, it's something where you open it and um, there's a spring that, that pushes out a bunch of glitter everywhere. And of course you're covered in glitter and you'll never be able to get rid of it. Um, and so uh, one of the ways to make the stories uh, about glitter bombs shift from possible to plausible is to ask yourself how to make one and how to send one. 
And what you do along the way is you start to recognize how you might notice when there is one. Um, so one of the first things someone shared in that, in that discussion was, uh, well, you, first thing you have to do is, is make it uh, packaging that is definitely not going to appear to be a glitter bomb. <laughs> so packaging that, that hides the true nature of it. Um, and then to make one, you have to have some sort of spring, some sort of platform and some glitter on top so that it all gets pushed out. And so when we asked about how people might notice if someone had sent them a glitter bomb, because they stepped through the, pro the pro process of understanding how to make one, they were able to say, well, it might rattle. There might be like a shaking sound. It'll be a package that I didn't expect, right? Um, maybe uh, unmarked packages are even more suspicious to me now. And so by walking through that process, I, I think there's something similar with Future Backwards where you can start to be sensitized to the potential signs of how this future might be starting to unfold. Um, now, the interesting thing with Future Backwards is that it, it's focused on sort of a polarity of like either the best case scenario or the worst case scenario. Um, but I think there's probably a way to talk about multiple futures because every single step backwards from the best and the worst is another fork in the road. And I think another place that you could start to examine alternative futures and, and notice when they were starting to occur. So I, yeah, I think there's a lot there we could use, uh, ways we don't quite yet understand about how to leverage worthy mapping and Kinevin together that would be, uh, and complexity based ideas together that I think would be excellent to explore at some point. Well, I'm, I need to go. So thank you ever so much for running this, Ben. Thank uh, you, Mike, for being here. And Hanno, like, honestly, I, I am so appreciative that you were willing to take a risk with me on this. Uh, I think I think I probably made Hanno nervous uh, because of how last minute I was waiting on the slides. <laughs> I think I, I think I, I put the slides together at the very last minute, and uh, Hanno was very kind to to work with me on that. So thanks, man. Thanks for being here. Thanks for sharing. Okay. I'll see you soon. I, I have to I, I have to go as well. So thank you. Bye bye. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Well done. And thank you everyone for being here. Thank you. Thanks. Cheers. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.